Oh, Judah destroyed it, so he won't blame me. Praise God. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, it's good to be here, and I'm glad to, to see you all. Um, I have with me this morning, not only do I have my beautiful wife, Charmaine, my partner and my prize. We met when I was 14 years old, and she stuck with me. Can you imagine? She stuck with me through thick and thin. And so, um, Sharon, would you come and say hello? Also, at the front beside us, my sister Peaches, my sister Kathy. Can you just wave? You know, my older sisters are here to make sure I behave myself. <laughs> Hi, family. We're so honored to be here this morning. I came, when I sat in the first service, Paul says, you want to say hi, you have a word to share? I'm like, no, I just want to enjoy being here. But the Lord wouldn't let me just do that. But um, in the first service, uh, my encouragement to you is that he says, your weapon is your melody. And he kept saying that your weapon is your melody. It's not because you have an awesome worship team, but because he says, as you live your life in true worship, in your work, your, your school, your college, every, everybody he brings your, your way, you are his love. You are his hands and feet. It's your worship that will be a catalyst for this church and the community. And then as I was in worship this morning here in this service, he, he reminds others this morning that he is the God of the breakthrough. I know I'm not the only one who's asking God for breakthroughs. I have four that I know of, four that I'm, I don't know when he's going to answer them, but I'm constantly before the Lord reminded that he is a God of the breakthrough. So he says, do not grow weary in your well-doing. Do not grow weary in, in doing the good that you do. Sometimes we feel weary even in the work and the ministry and the good that we do even for our very family. But God says, do not grow weary. He is the God of the breakthrough. And to our worship leader over here, God showed me you are like a bottle of sparkling champagne. And when it pops, that, that Holy Ghost stuff that comes out of you is in, in the presence of your worship. You bring the people before the Lord and there's deliverance and healing and there's so much power in what you have. So nurture it and fan that flame. And it's an honor for us to be here. Thank you. So sweet. Awesome. And um, also, it's really my privilege, the first time I'm here in the, the new space. And so congratulations, guys. That is the Lord. I've known uh, Trudy for a very long time. Actually, we went to CAST together when it was called CAST. We were these little dots um, getting into school through, I guess, our different yeah, contexts. And, you know, I was, we we're 15 years old and getting into CAST. It was impossible. And um, we can say no because all the people who let us in are gone and they can't get in trouble anymore. But we got in and we're there at a, in, the, in, the, in that reception area. And um, I was like, well, I'm hoping I get in. And she's like, well, I'm hoping I get in too. And when we checked it, we were the kids, the babies in the school. And uh, we've been friends ever since and seen the Lord just bring Junior into our life and get saved and been there through every part of the journey and being part of this journey now has been our our privilege and also our joy and so if you don't realize it because sometimes when they are with you we can take for granted you have a treasure in junior and trudy tucker you have a you have a grace of god that's blessed you and so yeah i'm telling you celebrate it because there are many who would love to be able to be where you are in terms of experiencing the grace of God that a minister into our lives. And so we're, Shaminar is grateful to get to be a part of it and to experience it together. Amen. How many of you here desperate for, for a breakthrough? You came this morning saying, God, I need a breakthrough. Yeah? Okay, that's you. Let's quickly stand to your feet. Let's just give it to the Lord right now. Let's just start early. If you, if you came, not just coming because everybody's standing, but I mean, if you really came because you know you want a breakthrough in your life, your breakthrough in your health, breakthrough in your mind, breakthrough in whatever area, let's just give it to God right now because he is here with us. And where the presence of the Lord is, there is healing, there is deliverance. Where the presence of Jesus is, he comes to pass out gifts. Now, the lady with the issue of blood, if you would just take hold of the hem of his garment, if you would just reach out to him even now, you can draw on the deposit in God. You can draw from the virtue of God from heaven because he's here. So could you come, Jesus, and just touch your people? Would you just reach your hands out to him now and just say, God, just right from the depths of your soul, let's start to ask the Lord to come and bring healing. 
the depths of your heart. Say, God, come and just touch me now. Because if you would just reach out and grab hold of him, his virtue would come and bring healing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God, we invite you and welcome you here. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, as you receive now from the Spirit of God. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Do it, Father. Do it, Father. I pronounce healing right now in the name of Jesus over every fiber of your being, over every body that needs a touch right now. Receive that healing from the Lord in Jesus' name. There's some of you here that your mind has been confused and you've been wondering about this and about that. And God would bring clarity into your thoughts even now in the name of Jesus. For the one who is worried about that family member and you're feeling distressed and overwhelmed and you think all hope is gone, God speaks to you right now and he says, listen, he is the God of all hope and he will not let you be disappointed that they will be saved and restored and rescued in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Jesus. The one who says that you've been sowing and you've been sowing and you, you've been waiting on the Lord to break through. He says it's, it's, it is at the door. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, let us pray, God, that even here in your presence, you would give us joy. Lift every burden, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated for a moment. Who just knew that you just got that breakthrough? And the Lord, yeah, the Lord did it. All right, there you go. So sweet. Sweet. So this morning we're gonna we're gonna dive into God's word together. I'm gonna have you, if you would, just turn with me to the book of Ruth. So there's a book in the Old Old Testament. I heard from Trudy that recently you, you were in the book of Ruth um, a few weeks ago. So you're so God said I've got more for you more from Ruth. So, all right. So if you could just turn to Ruth chapter one, we're going to be reading all of most of chapter one together. Well, I'll be reading it for you. As you know, Ruth is um, a very popular person. She's read often at weddings as she would describe her commitment to Naomi, your people be my people. You're, you know, like I will never leave you. Um, and it's, it's, it speaks to loyalty and the whole idea of being able to be fully committed for life. And that's the story of Ruth. But touch a person beside you and say, he's not talking about that today. we will say that for the wedding. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I see that hand. Nobody... <laughs> is, that a, is that a word for 2020? So today, as a, a, a topic, as a theme, as a title, we're going to talk about staying in your sweet spot. Staying in the sweet spot of what God has provided for you and not departing from it. Not missing where you flourish. Not missing the place where God has established you. Not missing your moment because you stepped out of line with your sweet spot. Amen? So tell the person beside you, stay in your sweet spot. Yeah, stay where you belong. You got to stay, stay in, the, in the place where God has, has established you to flourish. And so Ruth chapter 1, it is our tradition, if you wouldn't mind, could we stand for the opening reading of the text? It is our way of, of saying to the Lord God, we're going to give full attention to your word. We honor your word because it gives us life and whatever you say, we shall do. And so if you're able to um, stand um, to your feet, if not, just stand in your heart as we, we do this together. Ruth chapter 1, it says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judea, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. 
Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. And after they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard that, heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. When Naomi said, then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-laws, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and wept aloud and said, and sorry, and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. And even if there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grow up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two went, women went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she said to them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Verse 22, so Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as a barley harvest was beginning. Let us pray. Father, again, we just bless you. Thank you for the reading, hearing, and the understanding of your word. God, I pray you give us revelation today that, God, you'd open our hearts to hear your voice because it is by your voice that we are led. It is by your word that we are fed. So, God, we ask that you would do this now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated for a moment. Let me give you some context for this, um, this story in the Bible of Ruth. It opens up by saying that in the days when the judges ruled, and it speaks to a time before the kings. This is after Moses, before the kings would come and have dominion over the people. The people, the men and the women basically governed themselves. The people of God would have the laws of Moses and the statutes and they would have the religious rituals and the priests. But yet there was no king to be forcefully holding them accountable. And so people did kind of what they wanted with the conscience of the good word of the Lord. I don't know if you recall when before the flood, when, Moses, when Noah came around, the Bible says that the people did as they pleased. They had no one leading them, and therefore they just kind of went into immorality, and God grieved them. But subsequent to that, when God would then establish his people Israel, and he would bestow upon them his laws and his statutes, they would govern themselves, and they would go to the temple and they'd worship, following the rules of the priests. But yet they had this sense of liberty. 
because there was no king. So the context here is, in the days of judges, what he's trying to let us know is that people did what they want. I mean, we know that Jesus himself said it in Matthew 24, that as it was in the days of Noah, so would it be at the coming of the Son of Man. In those last days, people will do what they want to. And the reality is, we live in a world today, in a church today, where you and I can do what we want. You have pastors and you have leaders and you have those who would encourage you with the word of God and speak life into you and tell you this is the way, walk in it. But at the end of the day, you do what you want. Facts. You govern yourself. You have the word of God. You have the spirit of God. But at the end of the day, they can't really tell you what to do. In the old days, they would, they would hold you tightly accountable. But now you have this liberty to be able to tap into the scriptures. And you say, well, I don't want to do that, Pastor. I want to do this. Because that is the freedom that you have. But this was the days in which this family lived. There was a day in which the accountability wasn't strong. In the days in which people were able to be free to do what they want. And the Bible says that there was a man from Bethlehem in Judea. And, and let me give you a little picture of what some of that means. The word Bethlehem means the house of bread. Judah means praise. Elimelech, the man, his name means my God is king. Naomi, her name means sweet or pleasant one. Are you, are you, are you tracking with me? The Bible says that they were, they were people not only were they in Jerusalem, I mean, in, in Bethlehem and in Judah, it says they were Ephrathites, which means fruitful ones. All of that sounds nice to me. All of that sounds like a very sweet situation. That here is this man whose name declares the Lord is king. And he lives in a place referred to as the house of bread. Are you with me? And, and, and he, he's a people who are fruitful. Man, this is getting better. His wife is sweet, pleasant one. That's a sweet spot. Are you with me? Oh, they're keeping up. I see your eyes. <laughs> and so therefore, this was his context that he lived there. And so how I translate it is this. In the house of bread, the family of fruitfulness, living in a city of praise, a man proclaimed, my God is king, and was united with pleasantness and sweetness all the time. That sounds juicy. It reminds me, I mean, the Bible does say, when we are happy, we're to sing songs of praise, right? We're to celebrate when we're happy, and, and we celebrate God because he is good to us. How many of you remember the goodness of God in your life? How many of you know what it's like when, when you're in the middle of your storm and God will deliver you? How many of you remember when you first got saved and you experienced the grace of God and you, you tasted forgiveness and you felt like, oh my goodness, I'm free of all kinds of stuff. Do you remember what it was like to walk with the Lord and experience that? It was a beautiful thing. But the Bible says that in that land of praise, in that house of bread, there was a famine. It says there was a famine. There was something missing. There was this season of being unsatisfied because there was no bread in the house of bread. There's a season when things seem to be in lack and insufficient. There was want for the first time in the house of bread. Somehow it seems as though that this place where everything was going all right, all of a sudden, something was not right anymore. I mean, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. But how come I'm in want if the Lord is my shepherd? What does he mean when he says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all? Why does not give us any affliction at all? Why does save us the trouble? Why is it that he sent his word to heal us? Why make us go through sickness any at all? I mean, I mean, I'm like, come on, God. Why is it that God's people have to go through these seasons? Are you with me? So this poor man cried and the Lord delivered him from all his trouble. But I'm saying, God, why, why are you giving me trouble in the first place? So that's what happened to these guys. Elimelech is like, I'm in the land, in the house of bread. People of fruitfulness. 
I mean, this is supposed to be the, the paradise, but something went wrong. There was a, a famine there that kind of threw things out. And let me translate it for us today. You know, in Amos 8, verse 11, it says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send famine through the land. Not a famine for food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the very words of the Lord. They, 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 their life, you know, we sometimes experience this unexpected turn when you feel, even though you've experienced God's goodness, that you go through a season when you're feeling kind of dry. Have you ever been there when you open the Bible and the words are not leaf leaping off the page for you? Have you been through that seasons when, when you have to be going through the motion because you're just worshiping, but you're just not feeling the presence of God? Have you been there when the people you thought, oh, you, everybody in church just love you and you're getting along, all of a sudden you just don't feel like you fit anymore or you don't belong anymore? That one time you, were, you felt significant, but now you just feel like, well, I'm just here. It doesn't matter if I'm here or I'm not here. Have you ever been through that season? This is what Elimic was describing. He was experiencing famine in a place where he shouldn't have famine. Or he shouldn't expect famine. Are you tracking with me? Elimelech was there and in a not feeling the reality of what was being described around them. And sometimes as believers in Jesus, we go through that. We go through this sense of feeling as though God has something for me, but then I'm not having what I'm expecting God to give me. Maybe you're even in this room right now. And you'd say, that's me, that I'm, I'm going through something, but at the same time, I'm not, I didn't expect it to be this way. I was thinking my Christian experience would always be a certain kind of high, a certain kind of, of thriving, a certain kind of, but somehow in this season, I'm going through some dryness. Well, you're in church on the right day because God has a word for you today. God has a word to rescue you today and to deliver you and to, and, to, and to help you today. As you would hear God, I want you to just listen to his voice. As you would speak into your circumstance and that he will set you free. So Elimelech, the Bible says, during the season of being unsatisfied, he decides to go somewhere. The Bible says he was going to go to this place called Moab for a while. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop you for a minute. Just, just clear the screen because it's not seminar. And so just, I gave him one notes, but just don't even put it up. You guys take notes for what applies to you. I need you to focus because I see everybody writing it. And it's, not a, it's not a seminar style. So it's not my normal style. So I'm sorry. Just, you can edit the video for that. But if you don't mind, just like, just leave it. There we go. Thank you. Because I don't want you to miss what God is doing because you're busy working with your intellect and not opening your heart. Does that make sense? So but, uh, the, 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 will, the, will the class on Wednesday, deep break, he'll give you all the notes. But for now, all you need to just be focused in hear God's heart as he's speaking to your heart so you can get the deliverance. Because deliverance doesn't come from the head, it comes from where? Are you with me? And so that just, let's just focus in for a minute. And so Elimelech is in this situation where in the place where there's supposed to be fruitfulness, there was famine. And the Bible says he decides to leave Bethlehem for a while. He decides to do what I call take a break. It's like, a, let me translate for you. It means, have you ever been there where you've been serving the Lord and then you just feel like, man, I'm getting burnt out, I'm getting tired. I just need a break. I just need some me time. I just need to just be able to stay in and just watch TV. I don't want to go to church this week. I don't have to, have to worry about being nice to my people at work. I just want a break. Have you ever, have you ever had that, that thought cross your mind? I just want to just go. Let me just go back to, the, to, a, to, a, to a session and just kind of just like relax. Let me hear down. I mean, so, so there is a limit. He's saying, listen, in the place that I'm expecting all this good stuff is not happening. And so I want to take a break. I'm going to go for a while to this place called Moab it is here is a temptation is a here is a crossroads for many believers today it is in this moment when Satan subtly suggests to you you know what you deserve a break you've been doing this for a long time just to stop because you're tired it is right there is a is the entrance to the slippery slope it is there the enemy says all right I'll almost catch you it's like he has a bait waiting for you to lead you into a into a path that could could really end things for you it is there where god wants to rescue you and to save you 
from what is about to happen. You see, the man whose name is my God is king, he chooses to leave the place of praise. His name is a proclamation, God your king, which I mean, his name represents praise. And he says, you know what, praise not working for me. It, uh, uh, let me just go somewhere else for a while. He said, many of us think that church is where we come to get some food. I'll get fed. Hallelujah. It's more than that. It's a place where you praise God. When God designed this thing, he said uh, he wasn't just designing it for you. To take care of you. To please you. He was designing it that you could please him. I've heard Christians make this very bad mistake. They go, well, I give, I give offering where I'm being fed. Or I need to leave this place because I'm not being fed. You're mistaken, my brother, my sister. If you give offering to the place where you're being fed, it means you're paying for a service and it is no longer an offering. It is a payment for something you're receiving. Therefore, it's no longer about God. It's really about you and what you're getting. But how I've been taught is that it's not really about me. It's really about him because God is God and I am not. Uh, well, let me, let me teach you one of our policies at Life Church back home. Repeat after me. Say, God is God, God, is God. and I am not. I am not. Look at the person beside you and say, God is God, God, is God. and you are not. You see, when we think that we give because we're, we are fed, it's coming to be all about us. But when we give because it's praise, it's then really about God. He said, the church will accept it when you do it the wrong way, but God doesn't. God said, Psh, unacceptable. Right? You remember Cain and Abel, right? Two of them brought offering, but God said, I'm not taking yours, but I'm taking yours. God don't have to take your offering. If it's about you, then it's really about you. It's all right. It's about you. Because one guy said, I want to give him this from my flock. Mm -mm. God said, no, you give me what's for me. Are you breathing? Yeah. But that was for somebody that says, somebody free. So when you're giving, you give because you're offering it as praise to God, not as payment because the church take care of me. I like the church. It's nice. So I'm going to support the church because they are good to me. Whoa. We've got it wrong. It's about God. This Western commercialism where we think we're in control and we pay for what we want. No, no, do that at a restaurant. But with God, we give him all we've got. Are you breathing? So therefore, Elimelech takes his family from the place of praise, from his sweet spot where he was meant to be, and he goes looking for satisfaction in the wrong place. Looking for love in all the wrong places. As for us who are over 40, we know that song. Uh, <laughs> and so the Bible says he goes to this place called Moab. He doesn't go up the road to a, another Jewish town. Instead, he goes to Moab. And you're like, what's Moab? Moab is a heathen city. Moab is a place full of idolatry and immorality. Moab, if he read the, the, the scriptures and what Moses has taught him in Deuteronomy 23, it says in verse 3, No Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord. Not even in the 10th generation. What is he saying? For the Moabite people, zilch, nothing, nada. They cannot. And he explains to them that it was these Moabite people who came against the people of God when they left Egypt. And they tried to hire this prophet Balaam to curse God's people. And God reversed the curse. And then God would say to them, the Lord would not listen to Balaam, but turn the curse into a blessing. And he says, do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live. Basically, I'm saying oil and water don't mix. Do not mingle up with the Moabites. Now, for those of you who uh, would like a little history, I'll give it to you. M the Moabites, you know where they came from? Do you remember this guy called Lot who lived in this place called Sodom and Gomorrah? The Bible says that when the angel of the Lord came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and they were going to burn it, right? Lot's wife died. 
And instead of running to his uncle, Abram, he would go to this mountainside with his two daughters. The same two daughters that he was going to give to, for the men to rape. Shameful thing. But the Bible says that when they were there all alone, these two daughters says, you know what? We are alone. There is no man. Let's get our dad drunk and let us sleep with him and have children by him. And you know what? The child was named Moab. He was birthed out of this incestuous relationship from people who took on the value system of Sodom and Gomorrah. And therefore they bred a, a tribe of people who had zero morals, who rejected God, who rescued Lot and turned against God. Because God took care of Abraham, but not Lot the way he thought he should have been cared for. Are you with me? So a bad breeder people. And this is where Elimelech decided to take his family. I mean, he couldn't just go somewhere else. Why there? Have you noticed sometimes when a Christian, for example, is in a situation where they feel dry in the Lord or they, they're not going through things too strong or somebody offended my church, instead of just like maybe go visit Jack Spratt Church down the road and come back two weeks later and get a little healing. You know what I mean? Instead of, instead of just, just go, them just go from here all the way over there. All of a sudden, they've gone to places that they, they, they themselves didn't even think was a good place. All of a sudden, these believers who, who, who are trying to get satisfaction from God is now looking for satisfaction from something completely not like themselves. Totally uncharacteristic. Because I can't, I can't find the spouse here, so let me go by to the other place and act like I'm, and mingle up with, because I'm looking for somebody. Because I want some satisfaction, but I'm not getting it in the house, because there's a famine for a good man or a good woman. So let me go look out in the places where I shouldn't look. Let me go give profile on, on the on programs and software and social media that I shouldn't let me let me go find the little hookup and hopefully like something can work out let me just tinder here and tinder there and let me just do this and do this and do that. he could not find satisfaction in Bethlehem so he goes to Moab my brothers my sisters do not do it even if there's no bread in Bethlehem don't go to Moab are you with me? Well, you don't know what I need. It's not working out. So I'm just going to go to partner with this brother here because him can make this money flow the way I... Don't do it. Him send me from California to tell you right now. Stop. Don't do it. You're in a valid decision. You're trying to think, well, maybe... Don't do it. Just don't... But, but don't do it. Are you breathing? Don't compromise yourself. Don't, 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 don't mix up and blend up because you're hoping the ends will justify the means. Let me just do a little of this so I can feel a little better and then I'll come back to the Lord. Don't do it. You know why? Because this man left for a little while and the Bible says he stayed there 10 years. The truth is you can think it's just for a weekend. But all kinds of things can happen in just a weekend. You may think it's just for a night, but all kinds of things can happen in just one night. You may think it just be a moment, but all kinds of things can happen in a moment. And before you know it, you've gone too far, too long, too deep, and you're out there and caught in where you really didn't want to be. My, I hope this is just like helping somebody today to, to make a choice, say, you know what, I'm not going to Moab. And the Bible says they left the place where they thought it was a famine because they were afraid to die. They get to, to Moab and the Bible says Elimelech dies. He dies. What he feared most came upon him. He left God because I was lonely and then they go somewhere they think they can find company and when they go there they're actually more lonely than they were before because of the righteousness of God in them those are not compatible with where they were and the people they thought would be their company now treat them like dirt because there's no respect to you anymore. 
Have you ever seen that before? Do you remember Egypt? He says, listen, if we try to do our thing in front of the Egyptians, they're going to despise us and stone us because we just don't mix. So when you go back out into the world and your people out in the world oh, having a good time with you, in their mind, they're already discounting and disrespecting. They say, you used to call yourself Christian. You used to talk about this and that. But what you know now? Are you tracking with me? Because when you go where you don't belong, trust me, you just don't belong. Are you breathing? And so you eliminate dies. The, the, the man who declared God is king dies. What does that mean? It means God was no longer king over this family. And their sons die. One of the sons, Melon, his name actually means sickly. And so the sickly one goes to Moab and he dies as well. Are you breathing? Man, it's rough. Don't worry, he's gonna get happier. Everybody's like, oh my God. The pastor is like, be <laughs> he's tearing me down. Help me, Jesus. But they settle there, and the boys married more by women. And then the boys died. It's rough. I told the first service, and I said to them, Puss and dog got the same look. Meaning that some people go to these outlandish situations and some by the grace of God get speared and delivered. But some die out there. Are you hearing me? You don't, you don't want to be that one. right? If you're already sickly, don't even bother go there. <laughs> if you're already shaky, don't even bother. Don't even, don't even bother try it. So these boys married Moabite women. One was Orpah, and one was famous Ruth. Now, God has a way. And this is the beautiful thing of the Lord that we serve. He has a strange way of taking even our dumbest things, our stupidest activities. He takes us in our, I mean, I've done some foolish, sinful, terrible things. And God, in his grace and his mercy, would take out of that mess a miracle and produce something amazing. I mean, if you imagine though, that these guys were not to be in Moab peaches and they go marry this Moabite woman and they now take on the, the culture of the Moabites. But somehow when they married Ruth and Oprah, they saw something in Naomi that says, you know what? There, she's not like us. We want to go back with them, with her. That somehow even when you, you've gone to the worst of situations, God is like, you know what? If you're turning back to me, I'm going to redeem that. And I'm going to make something happen where there was nothing. I'm going to take what was stained and marred, what was ugly and destructive, and I'm going to now move it now towards my purpose. God somehow has the ability to turn everything for the good for those that love him. And the Bible says that when she was coming back, her two daughters-in-law were going to come with her. One says, you know what? All right, mama, thanks for for the, for the alt are gone but one stuck with her and you know what god did god allowed ruth to marry boaz and gave birth to a son named obed and obed gave birth to a son named jesse and jesse gave birth to a son named david and david became the king of israel who would then be in the line of our lord and savior jesus christ from a moabite woman are you hearing me that i'm here to tell somebody that god can take your greatest mess and when you turn back to him when you are coming home to him he would take even that mess and make a miracle that would change lives forever i am grateful for that mobile woman named ruth if that fool did not go to the wrong city god would not have had ruth in his lineage but instead god took his foolishness and he turned it around are you breathing? Yes. Yes. Wasn't it God who took those spies who, who went and got that little lady? Remember her? You remember that? Remember, what was she again? I don't want to say the name in church. Yeah, I can't say it from the pulpit. But she was that kind of lady. And God would take her. And out of her would come the Messiah. Do you remember this guy named Solomon? 
Do you remember that his father David go kill off a man, take away his wife, rape her, have baby by her, then marry her and lock her into a room? And God says, You know what? You did a wicked thing, but I'm going to take that around and I'm going to call Solomon to be the prize of Israel and he would be the apple of my eye. Are you here? God can take your worst mess and turn it around. So even though I'm warning you, don't go to Moab. I'm telling you, if you've been out there, don't think that he's over with you. That he is still not done with you. Even if you lived out there for too long, even though you destroyed your life in many different ways, God says, when you're coming back home, I will turn that around and fulfill purpose beyond your imagination. So do not stay in Moab thinking, oh, I can't go back. No, 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 baby. You come back because when you come back, he will see you from a distance and he will run and he will hug you. In the business with a, with a coronavirus, he may hug you and he may kiss you. He may put on clothes on you, shoes on you, and have a party for you and say, I don't care what anybody else may say. You are mine. Are you with me today? That is what God has in store for you. That's what it is. is when he, when, for moments like this, is when we need our worship leader to help us. Is this moments like this when we have to go? I raise a hallelujah. Where did my what? You 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 you're you tuning in. But it's the time that when, it's when you start to really sing. Why? Because God is so good that He can rescue you even from you. He can save you even from your own mistakes and your own failures. That he can turn things around. And that's what he did with these people. But the story continues. She returns now with Ruth. And the Bible says, when she gets to the town, there was a stir. Everybody start talking. Wait, who, wait. Is Naomi that? She don't look as good as she used to. You know what I mean? It was like, hmm. She lose a little weight or whatever. You know how people are. Them just like to talk. We humans have a have a weird way, but we, but we it's just the nature of our fallenness that she comes back to town, and the Bible says there was a stir in the town. Let me tell you something. When you see the prodigal coming back, don't be like the older brother and despise the celebration, but instead be part of the celebration to welcome him back. There are people who want to come back to church, but they're, they're shame take them. And they say, I don't want to come because people are going to say this and say that about me. But thank God, not for this church. I think on the little logo, you said, no perfect people alone. So therefore, everybody can come back. It's all right. We know you're not perfect once you step through the door. Because if anybody comes to the door who act too perfect, truly is like, boss, man, you don't belong here. <laughs> it's like no, 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 not, not. This is not the place. You go down to Pastor Jack Spratt down the road, where the perfect people are. But when you come in here, this is a safe place for those of us who are in process. Are you with me? And so, is that true? And so, what happened is she's coming to town, and people start talking. And I want to warn you, and I want to encourage you, that when people are coming back, don't start talking. Don't start saying, "Boy, so, sh sh sh. boy, you see him." I, 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 I didn't hear about him, you know. You, 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 you look a whisper. You look and you go, you look at the person beside you. You know, you know that kind of way? It's like you look and you say, mm hmm. I told you. Because the thing about this, right? When people are coming back to the Lord, take it from me, they are very fragile. Do you know how much courage it takes for them to show back up? Worried that maybe God will expose them. It's a nerve-wracking thing, you know. So we've got to be like those that when we see people coming back we haven't seen for a long time. Don't ask them a hundred thousand questions. No, just say, where you've been? Hmm. I saw you on Facebook. I drink up the thing. Mm -hmm. Don't bother. Just hug them and welcome them back as a come back home. Just a come back home. Let me tell you the story of Pastor Drew, guy we met some years ago, about six, seven years ago. He was telling us his testimony of how he came back to the Lord. He was a minister in the church and served very faithfully. And he, he screwed up, felt caught into sin. And then one thing led to another. He got demoted, taken out of his position. Shame took him and he went to Moab. 
he went out into the world for some years. After the world beat him up and it wasn't satisfying anymore, he got angry with himself and he was so down on himself. He said, you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm done. He was an ex-military guy. He said he got some of that, what we would call liquid courage, where he drank himself. He got his firearm and put it on his neck to shoot himself. And he said he pressed the trigger and it went click. He says all his years in the military and almost every other week when he'd go out shooting, his gun has never stuck like that before. And that moment he said he started to shake and said, God, God, because he realized God was sparing him. He cried himself to sleep. And when he woke up the next morning, which was Sunday, he said, God, I'm going to go back to church this morning. And if you accept me, God, I'll come back. But this is it. If not, I'm going to just end it. He made up his mind. He showed up at the church the next day. That same day, that morning. And when he was coming into church, a sister saw him who knew him from years before. She was like a greeter at the door. And he was nervous. But of course, he's a big, strong guy. So he kind of kept his composure. But he was just walking up. And she saw him. And in his heart, he was shaking. And the lady came up to him. And she said, Pastor Drew. And she hugged him. And said, I'm glad to see you. I miss you. I love you so much. He broke in that moment. He never remembered what the preacher was preaching about, but he said he was first at the altar. Because in that moment that lady met him, before the service even started, he felt the welcome and the love of God pouring out in that embrace. Are you hearing me? He got restored, got healed. No, he's pastoring again. On fire for the Lord. And I always wonder when I heard his testimony, what would have been his story if he met the wrong person at the door? What would have happened to him that Sunday morning if the person who was at that door treated him with any kind of disdain, treated him with any kind of suspicion, spoke to him in any kind of way that suggested that he did not belong there anymore? What if he wasn't treated like who he really was, a brother in Christ? Are you breathing? You don't know the power of your look, the power of your embrace, the power of your smile. You don't know when somebody walks in this room what they need in that moment. And if you can allow the Jesus in you just to love them the way he loved you, you would be the agent of changing a life. Because I know that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. That when I did not deserve it, he rescued me. That when I was choosing a path where it was leading me away from him, he interrupted my life and saved me. And I don't deserve it better than anybody else. It is by the mercy of God why I'm here today. And so therefore, when someone is coming from Moab, doesn't matter where they were, we must let the love of Jesus embrace them and love them and say, man, it's good to see you. Are you breathing? So Naomi got to the town and people were busy. And one of them said, Naomi, is you that? And she said, hold on, hold on. Don't call me Naomi. Because Naomi means what? Sweetness. Pleasant one. She said, I'm not pleasant anymore. She says, call me Mara, which means bitter. Because I'm upset. I've come back home, but I'm angry. I've lost my husband. I've lost my sons. I've, I've nothing. I said, she said, I left here full, but I've come back empty. But the question was in my mind was, if you were full when you left here, why did you have to leave? If the prodigal had all of his daddy's stuff while he was living in the house, why would he want to leave? Because sometimes we don't know the good we have until it's gone. 
We don't know how precious you have something till you have walked away from it. You have made the small things that you're not satisfied with become so big that you left. And then you go out and live in regret. Like, man, I wish I never did. Are you breathing? It was not God who told her to leave, you know. It was not God who told her to go and live in the Moabite land, you know. But yet, if you read the text, she was blaming God. God was wicked to me. He treat me with unfairness. Oh, all my God has turned. God is like, I haven't turned my back on nobody. I've been waiting by Bethlehem, waiting for you to come back. God, my mother always told me, she says, listen, when we think God has left us, he, she said to, he said to me, God hasn't left us. We just left him. He's still where he is all the time. You just need to come back to daddy. Are you breathing? And so there she was, and she made the fatal mistake that many of us make. She identified herself with her circumstance. She said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. And there are some of you who have labeled yourself based on your experience and your circumstances, not based on who God has named and called you to be. There's some of you have named yourself failure. You've named yourself unlucky. You've named yourself based on your circumstance. Boy, I made us broke. Boy, I made us miserable. Boy, I made us that. Boy, I made us about temper. Blah, 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 blah. We have named ourselves outside of the divine calling of God. God says about me, I am loved. I don't, God says, I belong. He says, there's a place in his house for me. Right? In my father's house are many rooms. I've got, I belong somewhere. Many, many. And he says, he says I, I'm conscious. And therefore, I don't feel like I don't belong. Why? Because I know I belong. Not because of my circumstance, but because of the one who spoke to me named God. Somebody said, well, I just don't feel loved. I'm lonely. I, listen to me. I am loved. I am loved. I am the beloved one. I am the favorite child. I'm one of his favorite kids. I know he loves me. He said, you know, even if I walk through the valley of the shadow, I'm not fearing nothing. Why? Because he says, I am with, listen to me. He says, if you make your grave, your, your bed in hell, I am there. You cannot escape from his presence. So what that tells me, it says to me that I am all right. See? You cannot define yourself by the circumstances. Do you know why? Because the circumstances change. Yes, Which means that you can be fluttering back and forth. One day up and one day down. One day happy, one day sad. One day you're confident, one day you're insecure. What a difficult way to live. But if you would define yourself how he defines you, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, you'll be able to walk in a consistency and a confidence that comes not from circumstances, but from your Savior, from God in heaven, who is able to hold you together no matter what is going on. You see, they defined Bethlehem because they were in a famine, not realizing that famines come and famines go. I've been young and now I'm a little yes young. <laughs> I'm not old yet. Hallelujah. And I've noticed in life, everything goes up, everything goes down, and up again, and down again. And you can measure your life based on the mountaintops, or you can measure your life based on the valleys. I've chose to measure my life based on the mountaintops, because from one glory to glory, I have to go through a valley to get there, you know, but I'm not spending my time defining myself on the valley, I'm defining myself on the glory, that I, I, I went through the illness, and I was sick for six months, I came to the hospital, but I'm healed. I'm not measuring myself saying I've been sick, no, I'm measuring myself saying I've been healed. I know it's like to have little, and I know it's like to have a much. I'm not measuring my life on, boy, it was rough in 2020. It was rough in 2018. It was rough. In, no, I want to say, I remember of the deliverance of 2019. I remember when God brought me back. Are you with me? You've got to choose to measure and identify your life with what God says you are, not what the world says you are, and not what your circumstances say that you are who are you today who are you you are god's child let me tell you a secret i don't know if you realize it 
Maybe you do, but I'll just tell you anyway. If God did not spare his own son, but allowed his own son to go to the cross, to be tortured and beaten and driven to hell for you, do you think that he would hold back anything for you? Do you think trouble or hardship would come between you and him? Do you think demons or angels could stop his love from coming to you? Do you think an economy or not could stop him from love? If he would not spare Jesus, what do you think he would give? He says, I've given nations for you. God. I'm, I'm gonna, it was only supposed to be a seven year famine, you know. They stayed 400 years, you know. No wonder them turned out to be slaves in Egypt. It was seven years in the peaches. God said, I'm going to give you seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. Save for the famine. Deliver your people. And they went there and they stayed longer. Because we have a way that we don't like to just follow God. You know, we stay too long sometimes in the other stuff. Are you breathing? And God says, I've got so much for you. I don't want you to suffer. But sometimes you set yourself up for this stuff. And I'm not having to come to deliver you from the decisions that you have made yourself. God wants to deliver some people today of the decisions that you have made for yourself. He wants to lift off the shame off you. Know, because all of us have made some dumb choices. And it's all right. If you would turn back to God today, he says, I've got you. If you make yourself resolute in your heart that I'm not going to be moved, I will not be shaken. I will, I'm going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I will not move. I don't care, God, even if I come to church every week and nothing will go on for me. I'm not move because my day is coming. I know that my Redeemer lives and he is going to come back for me. That's what God wants for you. Let's pray together.